Hello, my violence-loving buddies. This is Depassion, also known as Mikel, and welcome to the final No More Side Jobs segment for No More Heroes. This game really set a benchmark for many proud owners of the game. How strong gameplay and intriguing storytelling can coexist in such a strange world through the sunglasses of Travis Touchdown. In this video, I'll be going over all the parts I would initially believe to be the good and bad parts of No More Heroes. It's story, visuals, and gameplay. From there, I'll compile a wish list for what I hope to see in No More Heroes 3. Now, let's start the vid. Story. From booting up the game, Travis is directly talking to the player, giving a brief history of his antics that led him towards becoming an assassin. The visuals do a lot of work here for our main character's simple recall. We see an assassin's defeat we do not get to fight, but with everything shown from the teasers to upcoming fights, Santa Destroy and the many characters to come, we are given a lot of information in a short amount of time. I was absolutely hooked, ready to rampage. Where the story was weakest was the side characters, those who directly support Travis while in Santa Destroy. We don't get to spend much time with Bishop, Randall, Thunder Ryu, Naomi, or even Diane. These people served well as functions, and they all had me more intrigued about their backstories and ties to Travis. Their dialogue was great for what was in the game, leaving me wanting more and to have our main character interact with them in cutscenes. Bishop got a thumb in his direction, Diane fell on deaf ears, and Thunder Ryu died in the only interaction that was fully directed in a cutscene, and not in text. That is my only gripe with the story, since the side characters support Travis, but not much of their relationships are really fleshed out. Now, I may sound like a fanboy here, but the story is meant to be odd, with the questions and wackiness that Suda51 is known for. I guess what I really wanted from the side characters is to be more actively involved in Travis's journey to becoming number one. Maybe Randall and Travis butt heads since it is a daft punk and a worn out wise man, learning from one another. Thunder Ryu can be the figure of discipline for Travis with a lot of great lessons to teach with only half of them landing. We can see how Travis is used as a guinea pig for Naomi, a mad genius who must work on the shadier side of Santa Destroy to make money. Hell, maybe even competing against other assassins and engineers who are supplying the other assassins with their weapons. Don't get me wrong, Travis interacting with Sylvia and the assassins is always exciting and funny, but seeing Travis talk to someone who isn't a business partner or a target would only make No More Heroes more dynamic when it comes to storytelling. Breaking apart the characteristics of the main character, instead of dumping a large part of, of Travis's backstory at the end of the game. Now comes my bucket of praise for the story. Introduction to the characters was solid, and the soundtrack supports their themes well. Hell, a fair few assassins don't have music in the background, and their first appearances are still fantastic. A lot of deeper meanings can be found in each of the assassins. From a worn out punk whose years of headbanging, clashing metal, clapping cheeks, and living in the first circle of hell has left them weary. Those are the few things I can gather from death metal, tired of the high life he has earned through killing. The story moves at a fast pace, which reflects the main character's attitude to the world around him, dashing straight into battle and ready to slash. Travis had a gradual arc that had him come face to face with his own ideals, if they were given time to form and latch onto the ladder of mayhem, each ranked assassin giving us a glimpse into what a headstrong person with a little experience can become if the dark side of the world really got hold of them. They get stylized and left hollow somehow, never fully satisfied or even at peace. A lot of funny moments and iconic lines are sprinkled throughout this crazy story, which to this day still leave me stunned. Visuals. The graphics at the time were pretty solid for the Nintendo Wii, really displaying in the console's early days what it can do with enough push and creativity. The constant black shadows contrasted with the various colours the characters carried steered my eyes away often enough when the game had slowed down or the camera struggled. The only time I had problems with the visuals was when a suplex was performed near a wall or a fixed object, cutting me away from the spectacle and reminding me that I'm playing a video game instead of letting me experience it in one smooth act. Another great visual feature is the different bathrooms. They complement each of the stages you hack and slash through. Check them out next time you drop a save. I believe no game is perfect, but for the time, with what I can recall, that was my only issue with the visuals, since I'm considering the game's aesthetics from when it was released. Gameplay. Now the gameplay is a big beast to tackle and simplify. My few issues with the gameplay are the lack of enemy variety, how the motion controls at times can be unresponsive and the slow down on death blows when striking multiple enemies. With so many missions based on killing, all that stand in your way, 
The biggest differences were if the enemies had melee weapons, guns, did not flinch, and had a crap load of health. Granted for what we got, these enemy types did demand some tactics on your approach and how to manage swarms, but overall they did not ask much on a first playthrough. Now if the enemies had different attack patterns among their own groups, or Travis had some variety of his beat attacks, then the gameplay could have soared even higher in my book as a hack and slash. Time to time I found the death blow motions to be unresponsive. This is an issue that was common with the hardware at the time. Still a pain, hurt my wrist swinging down too hard as well. A real level 2 owie right there. The last issue I noticed with the gameplay was the slowdown. Mainly from slashing too many enemies with death blows. It looked badass when I was younger. I thought it was on purpose, but now I see that it is not a design choice, but a stressed machine crying out for help. <laughs> However, the beam katana combos and simple beat attacks were in a combo system that was easy to grasp and with some time, one to get creative with. Snapping between high and low combos to keep the string going. Tapping a beat attack that either launches the opponent across the screen, turning the enemy around, or simply interrupting the attacks. The beat attack had a small part to play in the boss battles, only chipping in to break blocks. This does reward a keen eye and not button mashing as often, but having more opportunities to punch and kick would be greatly appreciated. With so many suplexes, it came down to what beam katana to use along with what string of high and low attacks with a beat attack. With those combined, you can pick and choose which suplex to perform. And god damn, these suplexes are satisfying. The motions are simple, thuds and crunches sound like music to me, and it can be used to knock other enemies over, with a bit of luck. Dark side modes came out depending what you do in combat before a death blow. Cherry was a good speed boost, Strawberry on the shortcake made you seriously surge with power, creating a death blow lottery. Blueberry cheese brownie gave you tank controls and a projectile that feels like it would travel all the way to Speed City given the right route. Cranberry chocolate sundae turned you into a murdering machine, only acting upon one button prompt per target. And Anarchy in the Galaxy made Travis burst of energy, eradicating all enemies on screen and giving him a long range option against assassins if he had a 7 available. All these dark side modes were each satisfying trances in their own right. Having them come out at seemingly random times did break up the combat. Popping off a dark side mode just before another area is unlocked can be discouraging, since it could have been more useful on the other side of the door. Storing these could be a great addition to the series though. Living in No More Heroes Motel has its perks. Everything is a few steps away, food is refrigerated, beam katanas and sweet shirts are stored correctly, and you get a spacious bathroom. We have a lovely kitty called Jean that we can pet and fuss over, which makes a nice change from the anarchy that comes with being a badass. Unfortunately, Travis is an up and coming assassin, eager to fight someone better than himself, which means he needs to improve and get upgrades. I'll dig into upgrades next time, since this is going to be one hell of a review and wishlist. See you on the next journey. Take care. Hmm.